Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Enterprise Training Manager. I'm very pleased today to welcome Dr. Dennis O'Neill, a retired federal official who was responsible for the management of the United States Fire Administration. Dr. O'Neill started his fire service career after joining the Jersey City Fire Department upon his discharge from the United States Army. There he rose to the position of acting chief. He earned a Bachelor of Science from New Jersey City University, a Master of Public Administration from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and a Doctorate in Education from New York University. He also taught in the Master and Doctorate programs in Education at NYU for five years. Starting on September 12, 2001, he led the United States Fire Administration's team at the World Trade Center to help FDNY reestablish their systems of command, control, and on-site communications. He is the recipient of many awards, including the Metropolitan Fire Chief's President Award of Distinction, the Fire Engineering Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Firehouse Magazine Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm grateful to have Dr. Dennis O'Neill on the podcast today. Let's get it started. Dr. Dennis O'Neill, it's good to uh, be reconnected with you today. Thank you for joining me on the Command Post podcast. Good seeing you, Tom. Good seeing you. Yeah, thank you. So knowing that you're kind of a, a wise sage of the fire service, uh, having a very long and um, impactful com- career on many, um, especially at your time at the United, United States Fire Administration, and you're still very active, right? You're still engaged in the community. What What are some of the challenges, and then as you see them, solutions that are facing today's fire service leaders? Uh, Tom, I, I took a look at that a little bit and uh, reflected, and one of the first challenges that I think a new fire service leader faces is self-inflicted, and I self-inflicted myself as well, and that is going all the way up through the line, uh, spending all of your time in the street, and then one day, you're parking at fire headquarters and you got a desk job in in headquarters, you're the fire chief. And you have all of these administrative responsibilities and you're looking out the window, hoping to see smoke uh, so that you can get out of the (laughs) office and away from the paperwork. Uh, I remember those days a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, the other piece of it is the unfamiliarity with the movers and the shakers and the power brokers and the behind the scenes people at City Hall uh, that can help you. So a solution to that problem is really, as you're going up through your career, if you aspire to, to get to that top job one day, um, see, seek out opportunities to uh, work in headquarters for a while, maybe take a tour in the budget office, take a tour in the planning office, take a tour in fire prevention, uh, take a tour. I mean, everybody might, yeah, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of folks like to go to fire investigation. And of course, that's sexy and fun too. Um, and you go to fires. Um, spend some time in city hall, go to city council meetings, uh, see who are the power brokers, uh, not not necessarily the ones you might think. And, um, you know, try to get some friends to meet people and and things like that. I had that advantage uh, in the city because I lived in the city in Jersey City as I was going up and people get to know you. So, I mean, that is one thing that I had on my side. The other thing that I had on my side was that I happened to be blessed with an extraordinary staff. Uh, it was a guy named Billy Peters, who was in charge of planning and research. And, and uh, he wrote the book on fire, firefighting apparatus purchasing. It's still a classic work in uh, buying fire trucks. Uh, the other guy that was in charge of the budget was a battalion chief, but he had a CPA. So I, I didn't really have to worry. They both of them knew way more than I did. and um, but. I con- I'm concerned about the fire chief that walks in and um, his budget director is there because he's got bad knees or he just got over triple bypass surgery. And you've got to watch pretty closely because you can make some easy mistakes. Um, so I, so I'm second, here. So, yeah. so I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just thinking about what you just said and, and um, I was taking a couple notes. So, what you just said, it sounds to me it's kind of three elements, right? So relationships are kind of key here, right? If you aspire, if you aspire to someday come off the truck, those relationships are going to be key because you're building trust. You're, you're getting some face time in and, and the adage is, you know, it is what you know, but it's also who, you know, right. They're, they're kind of 
they're both important, yeah. right? They're both important, but the who becomes more important as you move up. Then I heard you say too, that the 40 hour, right? Cause I know for me, it was, it was a profound adjustment, right? It was difficult. And I think for many of us that loved the shift work, the 24 hour shifts, whether it's a three, four five, six, you know, one on two off, um, it's a big adjustment. So I, that's something that you, you shouldn't underestimate. And then also understanding a little bit of the politics and the administrative procedures that are like, that are like the underbelly of running a fire department. Would you say, I mean, that, I mean, not to, you know, to sum it up, but that's the things I'm hearing that I, if I were um, still in the fire department and aspiring to be a chief, it seems like pretty, pretty sage advice. Yeah. The, the thing I want to use, I want to define the word politics first, because everybody in the fire service, I shouldn't say everybody, that's wrong. A lot of people in the fire service is true politics. They say, I don't, I don't want to be involved in, in politics. And politics defined is simply the art of influence. And um, we deal with politics every day. If you have children, you deal with politics. If you're married, you deal with politics. And um, if no matter where you go, no matter what you do, the kitchen table in the firehouse, to some degree, is politics. Right. And, you know, you cannot ignore the fact that you're going to have to be able to influence people with either um, data or uh, depending upon what they're looking at or charm or, or whatever it takes uh, or expertise uh, to help them. But I, I tell people, if you really want to see politics, the purest form of politics, go to a food store and stand up in the front of the food store where the checkout lines are and watch the mother with a three-year-old in the basket as she passes the candy rack. That kid has a doctorate in mom. <laughs> OK, that kid wants candy and that kid knows just what buttons to push to get mom to buy candy. And from the time we're two and three years old, we practice politics. So uh, politics is a pretty important part of the job. So despite the polarity in, in our country right now, it's not necessarily a bad term when used for good purposes, right? No, it's not Republican and Democrat. It's right. not parties. It's the, I define it as the art of influence. And that's a pretty important skill set. Yeah, and it's a, and it's important to, I think, for all of us to understand that 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 differentiator there that it's that word politics has a lot of negative connotations today, and and it's it, in our world whether it's families, friends, there's it's still there's an element of you know being political in the sense that your influence, as you say, right? I mean, whether it's a small small you know where we're going to go for dinner kind of kind of deal or what uh, what software you're going to use and choose for your fire department, right? You bet. You bet. And you were going to, I'm sorry, when I interrupted you, and I'm sorry, yeah. you were going on with the second point. So the second thing that, that fire service leaders are facing today, it, and it's an old tried and true statement about recruitment and retention, but there's really a couple of elements to it that I, I want to share with folks. Most people think that it's solely a problem of the volunteer fire service, but it's not. The career fire service is facing the same thing today. First of all, for the first time in, in my career, I'm seeing advertisements for firefighters. That right. People are advertising heavily and they can't seem to get uh, people to join the department. Um, that may be because the economy is, despite what you may read in the papers, the economy is doing pretty well. Uh, the Jobs are pretty plentiful. Unemployment is low and, and people have options. But the other thing that, that is uh, maybe lost and it's pretty much a longer term issue is the fact that some career departments are moving from defined benefit pension systems. You get 50% of your pay after 25 years to defined contribution pension systems, which means that you put in money and the city puts in money and you've got this pot of money that you control. For like and what's happening, sevens, right? 457s, 403s, 401ks. So what happens is um, the poorer paying departments are constantly churning personnel because they're always looking for people. They hire them, they train them, and then they say, oh, I'm going to go over to the other department over here and take my pension with me. So the poor paying departments become this constant churn of, of people. And they're spending money to train them and sure. they're spending money to hire them. And then they leave. Um, 
On the volunteer side, the stories about recruitment and retention are true. In Pennsylvania, where I happen to live now, I think the, the statements is in the late 70s, they had 300,000 volunteer firefighters. And this year, they're down to like 38,000. You know, quite a quite a diminution of service. This, no, we're talking, this is Pennsylvania. And then from what year to what year? Pennsylvania. From what year to what year? From the late 1970s. Okay. So in other words, 50 years. Wow. To today, so yeah. 90% About reduction. 38, 30. Yes. So um, there's a couple of things going on. Um, the first is, I, and I really don't have the answer, but um, what we're seeing is what I call the t-shirt firefighters, the people that join that want to be the firefighter, but don't show up for training, don't show up for fires unless somebody says over the radio, uh, I got flames and smoke. And then, of course, they're out the door. Um, but it's, it's a commitment that we know all of the answers. You know, people don't live in town anymore. Uh, the two working families, uh, two parent families are working. Um, the other thing is that I, I think we're whispering past the graveyard on Tom is the fact that few people are speaking truth to power. If the fire chief is not willing to say, my people aren't showing up. Oh, we can handle it. You know, the neighbors see the fire trucks in the door. They figure the fire department is operational, but in fact, um, they're missing calls and, and not making them, you know, and there's a full sense of security false sense of security in the community and some, not all, some uh, fire chiefs are reluctant either to tell people bad news or they're ashamed of their organization, but it's not getting out uh, that they're not getting the services that they believe they are. Well, and I mean, you just said quite a bit there and I want to, I want to start with, we'll come to the, the chiefs and the challenges that some chiefs are facing to be able to kind of Face the, face the truth or be able to communicate it because maybe by communicating it, they might be able to get some of those resources if they were ever better able to communicate it. But that advertising for fire jobs, I mean, I was just, you know, doing my Facebook check in the morning and I saw yeah. a couple just today. And I remember down here in Southern Arizona, I mean, I was blessed to get into the Academy in the first attempt, but it took many people, multiple attempts because there was such a you know, demand and so many people testing. And I think that's maybe still the case in some areas, but uh, there was very little advertising needed when, you know, they might post that the job's available and then everybody kind of came. And I want to touch on, on the volunteer and then the, the careers having to do that, the churn, because the fire service, and again, I may be a little idealistic here, but it's like one of the last noble professions out there. Right. And I think it's, oh, I agree. it's, um, it was always very appealing to me. I was going to be in, in the air force, got sick. They said, see ya. And thankfully I found my way with, with the fire service. And so it's a noble profession. So I think people that aspire to some be something and part of something more than themselves, it's still um, very appealing for one. The pay is usually not too shabby. It's certainly competitive. Um, and again, you don't, and I don't think any of us joined it to become uber wealthy, but that stability of pensions and certainly a 457, those things that give you some later in life stability, um, financial stability is certainly an added, an added blessing. But I think the fact that we're having to do more aggressive recruiting, what did, and again, what does that, from your perspective, what does that speak to our current state in, in a job that, that is really so, such service oriented, um, is, is so service oriented, um, what, is it, what does it speak to today's state of affairs and the state of society when it's even fire departments are struggling to get hires? Yeah. And I, I, again, I said it before, I really don't know what the answer is. I think that there are, I mean, people can point to things like changes in society, but changes in society have been going on for millennia. I mean, it just right. constantly changes. Um, I think that the people who have are in the employment or looking for employment are looking for you know, other things outside of being able to be in something bigger than themselves. There will always be a segment of our society. There will always be a group of people among us who are attracted to that. But um, for example, um, last evening, they had a special, not special, they had a 60 minutes segment on uh, the healthcare system. And people are leaving uh, physicians, nurses, 
of leaving the profession because of the, the demand on them. And um, they don't know what to do about it. The schools can't produce enough people that they're hiring. And, and they asked three CEOs of hospitals uh, around the country. And the person said, if I offered you 50 nurses, would you hire them? Well, three of them raised their hands. Said, if I offered you 100 nurses, would you hire them? The all three raised their hands. If I offered you 150 nurses, would you hire them? And all three of them said, tomorrow. Mm. Wow. So um, I don't think it's unique to the fire service, but I think like others, we're facing the same challenge. Are we telling the right story? Because people would ask me, you know, I, I mean, I lived it, loved it. I was overly identified by being a firefighter throughout my career. And one thing I learned is I kind of enjoyed being a medic more than firefighting because we didn't do as much firefighting. So do you think there is this sense that you're going to be, you know, putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. And in reality, it's not Chicago fire. It's not, you know, and I don't, I don't mean the department, I mean the TV show. Yeah. And, I get uh, it. Yeah. and uh, I mean, if, if you can communicate the sense of giving back and that, yeah, you're going to be picking up, you know, so an elderly person that has no one else to call at three in the morning to get them back into bed, which, you know, some departments provide that service. Well, certainly a call that we're not all excited to get up at three in the morning for it's impactful to the person that you're providing that service to. So our departments or and maybe they are, I, I don't know, but um, are they doing a good enough job portraying what the job is really all about, right? That it's, a, it's a service job that has a really big element of paramedicine or, you know, pre-hospital care. Right. Mm -hmm. So do you think we can do better there? I think we can. And um, I'm going to make a statement here that I have no qualms about making. And that is if you were a paramedic in your 20 years, you saved more lives than I ever did as a firefighter in Jersey city. Yeah. And really you did, but I think we sell the Chicago fire TV series of, you know, saving babies out of burning buildings and, you know, jumping across roofs and things like that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's really not the job. And I think perhaps you've hit on something, Tom, that maybe we should be telling the great story of EMS in the fire service and the number of lives we actually do save and the changes and the impacts that we have on people who have no other place to call, no other place to go. Uh, they call you and, and you're there to help them. And if that means getting them off the floor and putting them back in bed, it, it to them, it's the most important thing in your life. Yeah. They're having a worst day or night of their life and it's, they need somebody to help them. And that help can be simple to us, but the world to the person receiving it. Sometimes you got to get that perspective shift sometimes and realize the impact you're making because yeah. Oh, I told, I tell my guys, listen, you can complain all you want on the way to the call at three in the morning, but it's game face when we get in the front door. Right. And just, you know, oh, professional yeah. oh, kind, yeah. professional kind, you know, the Brunacini be nice. Right. So. Yes. Now this is, it's, and then the, the, the truth, the power. So fire chiefs, right. So fire chiefs um, that you, you mentioned two things, either they're unwilling, unable, or there's a, there's a sense of shame because they're not able to deliver the goods or deliver the, the services really. Um, but maybe if they were able to better communicate it. And, and again, maybe we're talking, are we talking career or, mo or mostly volunteer or, or even both sometimes, right? That sometimes just to communicate your needs, maybe we'll get you those needs or at least a path mm -hmm. forward, right? Yeah. Now, uh, one of the successor fire chiefs in Jersey City, his name is Steve McGill. And Steve is, was a great firefighter coming up. I love the guy. You know, I knew him as a firefighter. And um, he has, he lives in, in the city. He has um, good friends in city government and uh, he's brilliant, he's very sharp. And I was just back, they had the 150th anniversary of the department and I went back, they had a big picnic and everything. And I was talking to him and do you know what his big problem is now? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have enough beds and lockers for all of his firefighters. That's how successful he has been. I don't know of any fire department telling that story. That's a good problem to have in a way. <laughs> well, it's still a problem, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, the point is, is that I, I have seen successful people. I've worked with them. And it just 
takes the ability to take off um, and, and you know tell the truth, lay it out on on the line, not not rudely or not uh, confrontationally, but just these are the data. This is what's going on. These are the challenges. Here's what I see coming. And the art of influence. Help. Yeah. Goes so back you just, to mentioned, Carnegie, you just right? mentioned a great segue to the next question, data, okay. right? So data okay. is data is going to play a role and we'll get into um, a little bit of your educational background because data played a really key role in your doctoral disser- dissertation. And so, but before we do that, um, that art of influence, part of influencing involves understanding um, the value of, and I say this high quality data that you can tell your story. And so mm-hmm. what role roles really does data play and maybe you know with some illustrations of your experience and and, and with your colleagues um the value data is going to be playing here with influencing others okay um let's let's start with the day-to-day data um the national fire incident reporting system um you can use that to put i consider it enters local enters data is putting your thumb on the pulse of the fire department you should be able to tell pretty much what's going on day-to-day operations. Um, you can use it to check on response times, the types of calls that you're going on and make sure that your staff are trained and, and equipped to deal with them. Um, pre-planning for uh, events or training, you know, hydrant locations or which are at opera, you know, in service or out of service, uh, unsafe buildings, um, any areas of under construction where road traffic is going to be a problem, those kinds of things. That's at the local level. That's what Enfers is good for. And this, and the example that I like to use is um, when I was promoted to captain, there were no slots, and I went down to headquarters. That was what they did in Jersey City. All of the spots were up for bid, and you bid on your seniority. And of course, when you get promoted, you get zero seniority. So the chief uh, put me in in uh, in the data shop <clears throat> and um, that was got my interest. So we started looking at Enfer's data and all of a sudden, I, when I went in, I said to the chief, I, said, I knew him, you know, he was my division chief when I was a firefighter. He lives in my neighborhood. We weren't, we weren't like best buddies. We didn't go out drinking every day or anything, but, <laughs> but I knew him, you know, I could, I, so I sat down and I said, chief, look, I'm really going to start to do an analysis on the data. But I want to warn you ahead of time that I might find out things that you don't want to know, but you're going to be the first to know when I find it. And I'm going to and I'm going to tell you. So we found out that I did an analysis after about two months. I did an analysis of fire department responses to city housing projects where we had a lot of civil unrest, people airmailing garbage out the window at us and, uh, you know, stuck elevators and urination and drugs in the hallway, you know, all the typical inner city stuff. So there was a battalion chief that was dogging it on responses to city housing projects. So I I went into the chief and I said to him, I learned this one and it it served me the rest of my career. I said, chief, I'm here to tell you bad news. And it's only going to last about five minutes, but you need to know this. So I told him the story. I identified the chief. And he said, Dennis, thanks. He said, uh, if that ever got to the newspapers, we'd be in trouble. And he picked up the phone and made a, had a discussion with the chief and the data cleaned up right away. But unless you're looking at the data day to day, unless you're keeping your thumb on the pulse, you'll miss things like that. I heard a million different kinds of stories like that. Another department, which I'll remain anonymous, had an automatic vehicle location GPS on their vehicles that they installed. Okay. And uh, these several companies were dogging it on EMS calls. So that was the beginning of why they put the automatic, you know, the GPS on the vehicles. So all of a sudden the data got cleaned up right away, but they were still getting complaints about slow service. And they found out firefighters being what they are, oh. they were putting a, they were putting a tuna fish can over the antenna. Oh my goodness! So, <laughs> so that it was only recording. Yeah, you got you got to love it. Right? He just gave a bunch of listeners some ideas. Right. <laughs> so, well, they had to hide the, the antennas on the vehicles. They had to take them all out and hide them. So, 
you know, I mean, these are the kinds of things that unless you got your thumb on it, you're going to miss. But when it comes out, it's going to be headlines and you're yeah. going to be backpedaling. Well, and then those and resources people are going that you to lose. wanted, right? Those departments struggling for resources, it makes it harder to get those resources, whether it's machines, manpower, or money, right? Right. And that city councilman whose mother-in-law died of a heart attack now wonders whether she died of a heart attack because you dogged the call. Yeah. So, so seeds of doubt get planted. Trust lo- yeah. The trust levels become less. So data's yeah, I've always, you know, in my time um, with, you know, so, uh, fire service software, you know, I would always see that, you know, it wasn't always the chiefs that were had the their their finger on the pulse of everything. It was a captain, maybe um, someone who had a passion for data, and then he would work with the chief and communicate that to the chief. Probably similar to what you had done, you had done yeah. so that the chief's getting the message. So it, again, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a chief. I mean, if you get can get un, understand the software that your department is using, whatever it might be, we hope it's first due. But if it's not, um, regardless, it's a path towards career progression. If you can get a competency and even better expertise in understanding and analyzing the data, the volumes daily of data that's being produced by your fire department um, to tell your story in a way that's not just, hey, everyone loves a firefighter. We're going, you know, we'll give you that fire truck. It's it doesn't work that way anymore. No more. I don't know that it ever did, but right. You know. Now, the next level of of um, data use is what I call the strategic planning, and right. Enfers is would be a piece of that, but a much bigger piece of that is going to be the city data, the census data. The census data is very, very rich. It'll tell you what's going on in your community. And we just finished the 2020 census. So um, you want to find out who's moving into your community, what's the socioeconomic status, what's the age distribution, which is going to tell you what your EMS calls are going to be like, you know, if you have an aged population or the predominant aged population. Um, You want to look at the building department data. You want to look at what are they building. You want to look at the city planning office. What are they looking at 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Uh, for the city in terms of development and um, the city council and the legisl- whatever legislative body you're dealing with, you know, what are the things that they're looking at? Are they giving tax abatements to certain kinds of businesses? Are these big super warehouses moving into town and are you going to be able to deal with them, uh, you know, in terms of sprinkler systems and fire suppression and, you know, um, all of the things that are associated with changes in the community? that are long-term. Now, I always said that, that the chief of the Fire Prevention Bureau and probably the chief or the head of the building department are the two most, they're more powerful than the mayor because they're gonna be determining what that city's gonna be like over the next 20, 30, 40 years. The mayor's only determining every four years at a time. Mm. And so you, if you're a forward-looking fire chief, you're gonna be looking outside your own data you know, your data fits into this strategic planning, but you need to be looking outside your department at other data, and it's all available to you. Even the smallest town has a library. And those, those folks are great. They will help you look up things and show you where to find things. And, and if you're from a medium to a large size city, there's a city planning office, and, um, and they have all of that information for you. So, so that's strategic- another way. Go ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So, you know, the, those are all the kinds of data that fire chiefs typically don't think about. So strategic planning, I, when I hear strategic planning for the organization and creating that strategic plan, which I'll ask you, you know, um, your thoughts on it, on creating a document that, that and then it, not just for creation's sake, but one that will be followed, you know, strategic plan. Mm-hmm. But a lot of what you just said with strategic planning revolves around community risk reduction. Um, exactly. That's what I was trying to say without saying it, because sometimes even that gets a bit. Uh, oh, I mean, it, when you say how, you know, you mentioned how being a paramedic EMT, you know, saving more lives than a one that would be, uh, you know, the department that you just provides fire service. Um, how about the prevention and community risk reduction division, the lives being saved there, right? Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. And 
Uh, we just had two tragic fires, one in New York City and one yep. in Philadelphia, a large loss fires. But I mean, there's an example of, um, unfortunately, the poor socioeconomic areas of a city have so many more problems and it's much, much more difficult for the fire department to, to deal with them. So, so strategic plans. Um, and again, we can just briefly talk about the value of strategic planning, which often a, a document accompanies that, right? A forward-looking five to oh, 10 yeah. year strategic plan, knowing that things are changing, but the depart- those are usually just full of data, right? And, and um, extrapolation of what's coming. Um, in your experience, the value they provide are they are they essential are they sort of important what what's your thoughts about a department that would create something like that if a department takes the time and effort to create it and follows it it's invaluable hmm. uh, i would add one other element to it and that is to make sure that it is congruent that it fits into what the city's strategic plan is if it has one it can't can't exist on its own it's it's got to exist in an environment that supports it. So, uh, but if you're going to create a strategic plan and it's going to be on the shelf that you pull off and dust off to show to local newspaper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, one other element with data, right. Um, Exposure tracking and Mm -hmm. with, with exposure tracking being, you know, we have cancer presumptive laws in many States, then you've got, you know, what NFPA calls the atypically stressful events, things that are, mentally and emotionally challenging, the pediatric drownings, the, 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 shoot, the, the mass shootings, um, those types of incidents, you know, multiple, multiple, you know, the one in Las Vegas recently where cars just plow through an intersection with, you know, three digit speeds and takes out a family, right? Those, those are yeah. calls that um, are impactful, but documenting those and being able to capture that information. So maybe at the end of a 20 year career, God forbid you were to get cancer or have some mental health issues, the parties that are going to have to pay, right? Whether it's at the state, local, county level, they're going to want justification, right? I mean, you may have, I'm, I'm certain you have more experience in, in this than I do, um, but we're hearing and seeing that that they're asking for documentation before they make any kinds of decisions and departments are struggling mm-hmm. to provide it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Tom, there's really two elements to this. And, and I want to, first of all, the fact that it's being documented is critical, as you point out, that um, they're not going to award compensation or cover your medical treatment if you can't prove that what you're being treated for or what you've succumbed to um, was job related. But the second piece of that is that how are you collecting the data? And this to me is critical. Um, and I had to deal with it a couple of times uh, when I was in the job, but Pension laws and workman's compensation laws and workman's compensation insurance policies all have language using words that mean something, Hmm. which are the pivot point between whether you do or do not get benefits. So when you're collecting this data, you've got to make sure that you're collecting the data that addresses those pivot points. So I'd like to make an example of this so you understand. In New Jersey, this is back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early aughts, I believe. For you to be considered a line of duty death, it had to be a traumatic event. Okay? Okay. So they defined a traumatic event in the law. It had to be a force exerted outside the body not initiated by the victim, blah, blah, blah. It goes through this whole thing, okay? Under that law, if you were in a three-alarm fire on the top floor of a burning building, saving a baby, and collapsed from a heart attack, that's not a line of duty death, Mm. okay? Right now, there are companies, I'm not saying any names or anything else, okay? There are companies out there collecting data on traumatic events and exposures to chemicals. And you better make sure they're collecting the kind of data you need that comports with your city and your state pension workman's compensation laws. Just the fact that you report it 
doesn't mean it's going to hold up when they push back and say, oh, we're not covering that because it wasn't a traumatic event. So uh, it's just a forewarning that just because you're collecting the data doesn't mean that it's going to be effective. What you have to do is to make sure that the data you are collecting comports with your workman's compensation laws, your workman's compensation insurance, and any pension laws that control who is, who is or who isn't um, eligible. That's, that's, that's extremely good advice, not only for agencies, but also for companies like mine um, to make sure that we're aligning as best as possible with these laws. Now, granted, will we align with all 50 states? Maybe, but getting as much of the data that they will be seeking as, as um, simply as possible, both from an agency and an individual documentation perspective, because I think there's an element there that it's one thing if I document my exposures, but it feels like there needs to be a validation from an agency perspective too, because I can put down what I think, and I might be right, I probably am, but I could be wrong. And so is there, is there, is there a quality control from, from the actual agency to ensure that it's being collected and, and arguably managed at an agency level, though with access to the individual to be able to see it and, and, and understand it as well. So I think there's some, there's some opportunities there. Uh, so the point, the point that you're making is critical is that you, when you think you're doing the right thing and you collected all of this data and then you find out 20 years later, it was the wrong thing. You can't go back and unscrew it up. Well, and, and then you're not only fighting, you're already at a weakened state for whatever reason, the health issue is causing you to file this claim. You're in a weakened state as it is. And then on top of that, you have a legal battle. Right. Yeah. No. It's some definite opportunities. So let's go, um, go back to the, your, your days of your doctoral dissertation and Again, these are this goes along with like some of the challenges that you faced, and part of that I learned from you know the last time we connected that your doctoral dissertation involved data in a big way, not just data for the dissertation itself, but it was about data, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, it was about well, it was about the introduction of data collection. It, it, it was really about the introduction of a technology into an organization, and uh, so if there was a whole bunch of different things that we learned, but the two critical elements were uh, what I'm, I'm going to simplify it for the truckies in the audience. So I'm, I'm a truckie, <laughs> never got a pint of water out of my, out of a pumper in my life. Uh, the, the two elements were training and follow-up. <clears throat> and um, so we pretty much knew that when we introduced a new system, there was going to require training from our officers. So we went through a whole, training process. We had the chief of the department on videotape introducing the lesson, you know, we're going to do this. It's important, blah, blah, blah. And we went through and more or less hand trained all of the officers on how to complete the forms. And uh, we went back down to headquarters and we started some quality assurance <clears throat> control, just kind of watching things. And a firefighter was working with me at the time. His name is John Alston is now the chief of New Haven fire department doing a great job up there. He came to me and, and he said, Cap, he said, um, I want to show you this report. And it was from a lieutenant. And he wrote down that he had a fire on an Indian reservation in Jersey City. So this guy's a comedian, right? He's oh, a wise no. guy. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. So he's going to teach us a lesson. So I went into the chief and I said, look, chief, uh, we, you know, we got a comedian here and we've got to teach him a lesson. And he said, well, you want me to call somebody? I said, no, chief, let me handle it. So I said, tell the deputy chief, I'm going to call him. That's all I want you to do about this report. So the, he called the deputy and told him. And I, and I called the deputy about two hours later. And I asked him if the battalion chief would pick up the lieutenant at the fire station and drive him to headquarters so that I could help him understand how these reports had to be completed because obviously he didn't have the training. Well, Jersey City Fire Headquarters is a block from the Holland Tunnel going into New York City. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. The traffic is unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Okay. It's, it's like nine highway lanes coming into seven toll booths. Oh. Right? And everybody has to pay, right? So it takes the battalion chief like an hour 
to get through this traffic to get down to headquarters with this lieutenant. So I said, and I greet them both. I said, oh, Chief, thanks for bringing down Lieutenant Smith, you know. Um, Chief, uh, there's a phone over there on the desk. Help yourself if you need it. And there's coffee in the kitchen if you want. And, and uh, you know, it was up the second floor in headquarters. He said, uh, I, I'm going to take a lieutenant over here. John is going to take the lieutenant over here. And so it was already pre-planned that that guy was going to be in there for an hour. And the battalion chief is out cooling his heels waiting for him. So now it takes him an hour to get back to the station. So I said, what do you think the ride back was like? You know? <laughs> and then I said, who do you think was checking those reports after that? And then who do you think, how long do you think it took before this, the word spread? You know, that if you make a mistake on a report. So the training piece is critical, but the follow-up is critical as well. So what, after a while, what we did was we pulled, I think, every 10th report or every fifth report, whatever it was, and we would we'd go over it, you know, and look for things. And, and, when, you, and sometimes, when, you were, when you were doing your dissertation and, and then this process in your department, was it electronic or paper back in the day? Paperback. Paper? So it was paperback, and then and then no data were hand entered. We had oh, uh, wow, okay, a civilian doing that data entry, okay, and then we had the woman's name was Violet. She was a lovely, lovely woman, and um, she was from St. Kitts. And oh, okay, she had, lovely, she had this lovely accent, and and uh, we treated her well and everything, but sometimes she would make an error, and we would call it a Violet error. You know, pilot error, violent pilot error. error. <laughs> <laughs> so when the data came up dirty, that was the first place we looked. Was it a violent error? And then was it an honest mistake? If it was an honest mistake. You know, we pick up the phone. But if it was a comedian or a you know, wise guy, they took a ride in the battalion chief's car to come down headquarters. It didn't happen often after that. So that so your little little art of, your art of influencing there, a little subtle art of influencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not hard. Yeah. And the word gets out. Well, and the word gets out and it doesn't. Yeah. And you don't have to be hyper punitive about it. Right. You just. No, no. Right. We're going to train you again. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell me. Tell, so. OK. So you did that in, in the department. Then you were there long enough to pro- see it go electronic. Yeah. Uh, not hand, not hand electronic. Um, OK. We, we were doing the data entry. You had access to a computer. Got it. But, OK. OK. But they weren't doing scanning yet, or uh, they weren't entering the data from a terminal at the time. Understood. Okay. And so with, with data, and then as you progressed in, in your career, and then went to the United States Fire Administration, I mean, I remember first meeting you when I attended the National Fire Academy, and you were the superintendent. Oh, wow. You were the superintendent. Um, you made an impact on me then with your professionalism. You, you, you definitely did. Um, the collection and now the cap, the, there's like collection and there's capture, right? The collection and capture of data. But a lot of what we still do is collecting where we're, we're hand jamming at keyboard and click keystrokes and then the capture of data. But, but as, as you became the United States Fire Administrator, what were the things that you saw regarding data in the broader fire service community? And now, you know, we're looking beyond New Jersey. We're looking all 50 states. Yeah. What were yeah, some sure. of the things that struck you most and, and, and how far, and, and maybe what you saw, and then how far we've come, you know, since then. Well, the advantage to it, I mean, people, uh, I want to make sure that people understand that ENFERS is really a, a local government tool. It's most used as a government tool, and it's immediate. You can get any amount of data you want out of ENFERS every 24 hours if you want it. You know that. And people think that it takes two years to produce the data. It takes the federal government two years to produce the data because they've got to collect it from 24,000 fire departments. And then when they get Mm. them all to get it in, then they have to do the analysis on it and everything. So it just takes time. And moreover, they have to wait till the end of the year before they get it. Okay. So as a federal tool, ENFERS is useful to the federal government in the following ways. One, uh, for training topics, in terms of the National Fire Academy, where we see you know, emerging trends on wildland firefighting or firefighter injuries or building collapses or whatever, whatever it is. Um, the second piece is that um, it helps us 
identify priorities for the assistance to firefighter grant program so that we can use that data to steer uh, federal funds to local departments based on what their needs are. Okay. And, and to be very honest with you, Tom, if you're a fire chief who's looking for a grant and you can't identify what your fire problem is through Renfers, they're not going to give you money. Oh, yeah. I've written numerous grants. And so, I, I mean, back when it first launched, in like I think 2000, yeah. 2001 was the early years of the yeah. AFG. And since then, it's kind of become a federal model for grants, if I remember correctly. It was kind of celebrated. It has. It has because it's a peer review process. We're the, the only government agency that has firefighters coming in to review firefighter grants. Mm. The police departments don't have cops reviewing police grants. And hospitals don't have doctors and nurses reviewing hospital grants. So it's, it's a peer-reviewed process. So the, at the national level, the data are a year or two old, 18 months typically old, but that's how we use the data. And then we'll also use it to produce reports about the fire problem in America. You know, what it is, we've identified what the problems are, you know, pejoratively, you know, it's the majority of problems are this, this, and this. These are the areas that you can use uh, locally but the, the, the value of the inference tool is at the local level. Well, and, and departments today that are using um, inference compliance software, right, for their incident documentation above and beyond um, all the other things that they're capturing. And I'll, I'll ask you about that in a minute. Um, you know, response data is kind of the core of what inference does. Uh, many, many of the, the systems being used they don't have to wait for a federal report. They can run local monthly reports, daily, yeah. daily, well, even daily yeah. reports if they wanted to. Um, and so capitalize on the local value is what, what you're saying, right? Don't wait for the federal. It'll come, but it'll take a little while. But the federal problem may not be your problem. Your problem. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. <clears throat> because if, if I'm collecting data from, um, I don't know, Palm Springs, California, and I'm living in Newark or Jersey City, you know, you're going to get different, the, different problems. Yeah, right? the, local, the local element, especially in our community, is key, right? It's, you can get a national picture, you know, of what's going on nationally, that, that the, local, the local use of data is where the, really the power is at. Exactly. The big power. Yeah. So besides your job, you know, as a chief, um, as, an, as a fire administrator, what other, besides looking at response data, what are, in your mind, what were some of the most valuable data sets, elements of running a fire department that just, you know, you love seeing these reports, you loved understanding it, again, beyond just incident response? What were some of the other things that were, were particularly um, memorable to you or very valuable to you as a, as a, as a leader of an organization? I always found that it was, um, useful, however, however you want to capture this. Where, when I began to see anomalies, maybe an increase in injuries or uh, firefighter injuries, um, <clears throat> an increase in lost equipment or things like that, okay. I'd, call the chief, I'd call the battalion or, and the deputy in. I'd say, look, this is what's going on in your battalion. This is what's going on in your division. Tune it up. Mm -hmm. So they would kind of watch these things. So <clears throat> it wasn't so much um, I was going to change the fire department, but it was a, a rudder that I could use to, to kind of change the direction a little bit here or there. The one instance where the battalion chief was caught dogging uh, city housing calls, uh, that was a sharp turn of that aircraft carrier, <laughs> you know, that, that turned around that day. <clears throat> but um, it was... It was making sure that the ship was headed in the right, right direction. And when it was veered off, I could get it back on course pretty easily by using the data because it was self-explanatory. Okay. I, I didn't have to come down like a hammers of hell on some captain or a lieutenant or whatever because they were making a mistake. And he'd say, you know, pay attention to this. This guy or this company is slowing down or, um, you know, they're – doing this wrong or they're damaging a lot of equipment or people are getting hurt, whatever it was. Sure. It was <clears throat> before it got way out of hand 
before we were completely off course. You got yeah, you got to exactly. see the trends. You got to see the trends early before they became a. I mean, trend trend can evolve into a significant problem, or it's just a trend you catch and reverse course or change course. Yeah. So I know you, and and again, as we kind of wrap up here, and I know you mentioned quite a few things earlier in the conversation, but in closing, what what's what are some things that you would want to impart on aspiring fire service <clears throat> leaders? So those that may be in those you know chief officer roles, but what about those that are aspiring to become a company officer, those that are, you know, are, are a company officer would like to proceed to become a battalion chief or deputy chief. What, what are some words of wisdom? And again, it can revolve around the data and technical side of things, but just even globally um, from your experience, what, what pieces of advice and, and guidance and wisdom would you impart to those, those listeners today or, or viewers of the podcast? Um, Tom, I, I think the, f- the biggest piece would be, um, well, there's, there's, let me try to this first. First of all, understand what's the process for promotion. Uh, in some departments, it's a competitive examination, which is what we dealt with when I was coming up through the job. Other times, it's a popularity contest in the volunteer fire service who are elected. Um, in other departments, you know, the chief, uh, we used to say, does this over your head and mm. you, know, you get promoted. But if, if the process is a test, understand that there's a difference between knowledge, reading the books, and taking a test. There's a difference between reading a book about baseball and hitting a triple, okay? okay. One, is, one is knowledge and one is a skill. Okay. You, you can learn all the, all the rules about baseball, but you'll never be able to hit a ball unless you get out there and practice doing that. So a test is the same way. You need to read the books, but you need to be adversant in test taking and learn what you're good at and what you have to learn and improve your weaknesses uh, in that test taking process. So one of the ways that you can do that and one of the challenges that most of us faced that, you know, we graduated high school or we got out of college and we get into the fire department and we, we know how to study, but we haven't been doing it for like five years. Okay. So you forget those study skills. So what I used to help people do is look, Every fire service book does the same thing. Chapter one is hydraulics. Chapter two is strategy. Chapter three is tactics. Chapter four is fire apparatus. Chapter five. They're all, every chapter is different. (laughs) Take all the books, organize them. Today, I'm going to study hydraulics. Chapter four out of this book. Chapter eight out of this book. Chapter one out of this book. And then tomorrow, I'm going to do strategy. And I'm going to do chapter nine out of this book. Chapter 16 out of that book. I'm going to read this whole book you know, whatever it is. So okay. organize your materials so that you're absorbing the information from different places in different ways. And then practice taking exams and, you know, go over them over and, and find out where you keep making the mistake, whether it's the way a question is worded or the qualifier that they use, or there's all, all different techniques. And then once you get on the list to get promoted, you have to be prepared to be uncomfortable because mm-hmm. you're going into a completely new role and you have to be comfortable. And the worst thing you can do is show your uncomfortableness by being a bully, by, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, I'm the chief and then we're going to do it my way from now on. I can, you know, sit back for six months and watch and listen and learn and help. And, um, you know, all of us, every job that you advance to, you should feel uncomfortable. You're going into something completely new that you've never done before. Sure. Some of us have egos a little bit too large that don't allow us to admit that. But, you know, one day I got a phone call and, and um, my boss suddenly passed away. And now I'm the career senior career fire official for the United States of America the next wow. morning. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, one day I'm a firefighter and the next day I raise my hand in city hall and I'm a Lieutenant. Okay. You, you know, it's, that's how it happens. And, and uh, so sit back, first of all, organize your material. Second of okay. all, practice test taking. Third of all, make sure that you are prepared to be uncomfortable 
in the new role and then take six months. Listen, watch, learn, help. Well, that's, that's inspiring and motivating. And where were you when I promoted? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure you had a mentor or two. Yeah. So we're all, we all blessed. This is uh, and we're blessed to have you today and and you taking time um, to spend it with us today. And I'm grateful to you, um, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to our paths crossing again and knowing that you were in Tucson recently, the next time you're here, we're getting together. Deal. All right. (laughs) Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.